treating acute myeloid leukemia with a combination of 7 and 3 back in 1977. Today, in 2019, we are still doing the same. So my question to you is, what is the best way forward to change this in the next 10 years by 2020? So your question is very painful based on the reality of what we said, what you said. The therapy for acute myeloid leukemia has not changed in the past three decades. Uh, adults with AML continue to die of AML, and the problem has been no real therapeutic advances on the, until the past few years. So for three decades, seven and three, and combinations thereof have been the standard of care. However, there has been a revolution now in the genetic abnormalities identified in all bone marrow diseases. The gene, therapy, the gene revolution occurred in hematology. Cytogenetics have always been a very important parameter in diagnosing AML and how we treat these patients, but there were no drugs specific for the gene mutations. More recently, a drug has been identified that is FDA approved for the FLT3 mutation. The gene mutation has been discovered for quite a while. The problem with the revolution is we do not have new therapies necessarily to identify or treat over 200 mutations that are present in AML and mild dysplastic syndrome. So we're on the cusp of a revolution that hopefully in addition to the genetic abnormalities, we will identify new therapies. The problem is the changes in medicine occur very slowly. Do we need the backbone of seven and three and add these uh, therapies that direct their attention biologically specific to a mutation? Or can we get away from seven and three? I don't know the answers. More research has to be done. The problem historically with seven and three is every time a new drug was added to seven and three, rather than improving efficacy, it made safety problematic. In addition, these are rare diseases compared to breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer. So the research dollars don't necessarily, despite it leading gene the genetic revolution uh, in medicine, the research dollars didn't go to those diseases, rightly or wrongly, because the commercial opportunities were not as great as the more common solid tumors that only more recently have been identified to have mutations of genes, but the drug development industry has gone after those genes in a very robust fashion. And in fact, for solid tumors, gene ther therapeutic directed approaches have been more successful than in hem hematological malignancies. Excellent, thank you. My second question is, there are approximately three and a half billion <coughs> papers that have been published on cancer. 135,000 in just 2017 alone. But there is a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and their translation into improved therapies. What are we doing wrong, Steve? Well, I think drug discovery and translational medicine is very expensive. It costs many millions of dollars to bring a drug to market. So American capitalism actually drives that process. Drug discovery is mostly still limited to the US. What drives that industry is capitalism, the opportunity to make money. So despite the, gen the advances that you're alluding to scientifically, someone has to direct their attention to those discoveries and make a medicine. So Rico Serta, the medicine I am working with now, has been in development for 20 years. That's not unusual for drug discovery until FDA approval. We hopefully are a year away from the FDA to consider approval for Rigosertib in 
pre-leukemic condition called mild dysplastic syndrome. So we've known about mild dysplastic syndrome for what, 40 years? It used to be called pre-leukemia. The reality is in MDS, we have not had a new therapy approved by the FDA in over 15 years. And the therapies we already have are not terribly effective. So I think the problem with bringing new drugs to the market is the expense, how rare or not rare is the condition. And it takes brilliant people to do this. We need more brilliant people. Okay. <laughs> Third question. The fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that cancer biology is different. But it could also mean that the host is different. Since most cancers arise in older age groups, then having good therapy may not be the answer because the host is already decrepit. Your solution? The solution is to stay young forever because you're right, many childhood cancers that used to be invariably lethal, to name two off the top of my head, maybe three, acute lymphoid leukemia, Hodgkin's disease, and Wilms tumors with diseases that invariably were lethal. 100% of these children, or nearly 100% of these children, used to die. These diseases, ALL in childhood, Wilms tumor, and Hodgkin's disease, are almost now invariably cured. Now, why is that? It could be that, as you're pointing out, the immune system may play a very important role in these diseases, as they do perhaps in adult cancers. But as we age, our immune system gets weaker, and we may not have the potency of a good immune system to help the drugs eradicate the tumors. Children have a more robust, depending on how old the child is, but children may have a more robust uh, underlying immune system. Perhaps they're exposed to less environmental toxins than adults may be. So I don't know the answer to your question, why kids do better than adults with cancers. And maybe the old adage that being young is good may not be far from the truth. Thank you. Fourth question. You have great knowledge and experience in this field. If you were given limitless resources, how would you plan a cure for cancer? What would you do? I, I, I wouldn't do it the way it's currently being done. Things called moonshot programs. In my view, great discoveries are made in a basic science lab in the corner at some university where nobody's expecting it. I, I think the, the war on cancer, how successful has it been? How many billions of dollars? have gone into a war on cancer. I, I think basic research has to be funded. And the only way to fund it is via the government, because nobody other than the government has the resources to put it into reality. There are cooperative groups, hundreds of millions of dollars. How much progress? have we made in adult cancer. So the cooperative groups have cured childhood acute leukemia. The reason that may be the case is almost over 90% of children with cancer are put onto a trial. In reality, in adults, probably one to 2% of adult cancers are put into cooperative group trials. So even though I just attacked them, it may be that it takes so long because there are not enough patients entered onto a clinical trial. I personally am very frustrated with our trial, Vigo Serta. We should have been finished with this trial two years ago. The trial has been up and going for three, over three years now. If we were finished two years ago, it is possible we would have a new drug for these patients. We can't uh, prescribe this medication, Regocertib, because the, the pivotal trial that the FDA will review to determine if it gets approval is, uh, will happen in another year. 
So in answer to your question, I think the mechanisms of cancer are the very basic, may have something to do with life, how cells divide, how these cells, yes. I will in a second. Thank you. Thanks for your point. How these cells uh, divide. All cells divide as we grow. It's amazing that we work as well as we do. Can you think of the complexity of an embryo becoming a, a child? Everything has to work perfectly. I think sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. That causes a genetic abnormality when the cell is uh, copied. Once that cell has a genetic abnormality, it's copied many, many times and the cancer develops. I think we have to put basic funding into understanding normal physiology, because if we understand normal physiology, how a child becomes an adult, how these cells grow, we'd understand cancer in a much better way. Okay, thank you. Well, the last question is more or less a philosophical. Offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancer, palliative but toxic treatment is a service or disservice in the current therapeutic landscape. I think I am a, I'm under the impression that 90 to 95 cents of every dollar spent in health care goes into the last year of somebody's life. A lot of that may be going to cancer care. And I think if some, we all know which diseases we have a chance to help and which we don't. I think a lot of those decisions have been taken out of the uh, purview of doctors. We have legal things that we have to respect. Do not resuscitate orders. Doctors used to make those decisions end of life decisions. Now we can't legally make those decisions any longer. We have to get input from the family. A lot of patients and their families don't understand when there is nothing we can do to help the patient. And there's also, I hate to say, which is painful, there is a financial inducement for healthcare professionals to continue therapy even when it may be futile. So I think it's a combination of not giving up when sometimes we should and a, and a financial inducement not to give up. And I do think for toxic medications, uh, I, I think at some point comfort care is important. The physicians and healthcare providers have to move from therapy, toxic therapy, to comfort care, and that's an appropriate transition for patients who have no therapeutic options anymore. Or, rather than using agents that we know do not work, put those patients onto a research trial so we can make progress and not use the same toxic medicines we currently are using, but consider putting those patients into a research study as well. Thank you so much for your time. No, it's always a pleasure, Oswald. Uh, thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too, thank you.